I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocatorspodcast.com. My guest on today's show is Manny Friedman, the CEO of EJF Capital, a firm he co-founded in 2005 that manages $9 billion with a focus on the financial services industry. Manny started EJF after his retirement from Friedman Billings and Ramsey, a company he co-founded in 1989 and served as co-chairman and co-chief executive officer. Our conversation looks back at Manny's lifelong passion for investing, the globalization of markets, and the financial crisis, and then looks forward at the newly created economic opportunity zones, long-term impact of government stimulus, stranded assets created by technological change, regulation, and philanthropy. Please enjoy my conversation with Manny Friedman. Manny, great to see you. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you, Ted. There aren't that many people who have a background, starting off as a history teacher, into a day trader, building financial services business. Where did it all start? It all started when I was 15, and my father said I could use a little bit of savings I had, which was $500, to buy a stock. I went down with him in Wilmington, North Carolina, to buy, he said I could buy AT&T. In those days, newspapers had fillers at the end of columns, and I read the filler in the uh, Wilmington Star News, and it talked about this new cigarette, Pillard, which had just started Kent Cigarette, and that it was a new invention, and it could have an impact. And I got down to the brokerage firm, and I said, I'm not buying AT&T, I want to buy P. Lard. And I bought 10 shares at 52 and 5 eighths. At that time, I went away to school, in a private school, yeshiva, in Baltimore, Maryland. So I got on the bus the next day to go to Baltimore, and I got off at 2 o'clock at night in Norfolk, and I got the Norfolk newspaper. The Wilmington Star News didn't have every quote, and I was very excited because the Norfolk paper at 2 o'clock at night had every single stock on the New York Stock Exchange. And I can remember it as if it was yesterday. I opened up the paper, and there was P. Lard, and it was up 2 and 5 eighths. And I just made $26, and I could feel my heart beating inside my chest and I knew at that second the only thing I ever wanted to do in life was to be in the stock market one way or another. And how did you go from that stock to the beginning of your career? So that stock was probably the last time I made money in <laughs> 10 in 10 years because then I took the money and invested in different companies, 10 shares, 20 shares at a time. But I began to study the market day and night when I was in high school. That was literally the main thing that I studied. And I would read the journal and clip out little articles and paste them to see if I could follow them. And that was my dream. And that's what I always wanted to do. You know, like many people in life, sometimes you're not sure of your dream. And therefore, when I went to college, I first went to Wilmington Junior College because I didn't even know if I wanted to go to school and my mother filled out the application and said you're going to school and so I went to Wilmington Junior College in Wilmington, North Carolina. Then I went to UNC and studied really geography, history, social studies, and education. But the entire time that I was doing that, each day I would study the market over and over again. And when I graduated from UNC, I came to Washington to go to law school because I was taught you never could finish your education. You have to just keep learning. And I tried to get a job as a broker. And I went to 10, 20, 30, 
40 different broker dealers, nobody would hire me because I had no sales experience. And I was young, I was 21 years old also. And so that was a bitter defeat. So I taught school in the day and went to law school at night until four years later, I got a job as a retail broker. And what was retail brokerage like when you started? It was brutal. You know, I hated to sell and basically you were given lists and you were supposed to call the people up and try to get them to buy different stocks. I was very, very lucky. I worked for Leg Mason and they had one, they had very strong values. And number two, in those days, they were very flexible. So the first thing they did, they let me write, write up stocks and do my own research. And I got lucky because I started right at the end of 71. Young Kipper War started in 72. I had begun to look at oil and gas stocks. And one of my big recommendations was Houston Oil and Gas, which went from 10 to 110 in a period of maybe four months because it was at a big, gigantic gas discovery in what we called then the state waters. State waters were not regulated, and federal waters were. So the gas was unregulated. So a big gas discovery had a massive impact on the company. And that was my big break because all of a sudden I had a little bit of a reputation, got a following, so forth and so on. And how'd you get from there to starting your first firm? One of the mistakes I made was I didn't, I stayed a retail broker for a number of years, slowly grew until I met some other people who suggested we go out on our own to another broker dealer and start our own institutional group. I literally didn't know what an institutional group was, but I had a following by then and I was known for doing research in different areas. And I also, again, Leg makes was very flexible. Uh, they let me also do some investment banking. You did a lot in the 90s at your old shop. What was the differences, if you look today, in a lot of the businesses you oversaw, hedge fund business, a private equity business, a venture capital business? How do you think about it then? How do you think about it today? I don't view it as dramatically different, at least for me. It's the same thing. You come in every single day literally knowing nothing and realizing you've got to go out and learn these new things and reinvent yourself. One major gigantic difference is a massive amount of money. That's one difference. Another massive difference is the world. When I started in really the 80s and then the 90s, you didn't have to think about what's happening in Germany, what's happening in China. There wasn't this extreme correlation that is today between every different piece that links up within the world. And that is massively different. The other massive difference is how much of the market is passive, meaning that it's either done by index or machines, which for me is a tremendous plus, and that is a massive, massive change. Let's start on the, the first part. It's pretty clear you've got globalized economies, and as people have continued to re-educate themselves, as you have every day, you learn about more in the world. Was it the case that people just weren't paying attention because they, they weren't sophisticated and didn't need to, but there were global opportunities, global diversification, and more people pay attention now? Or was it more about the economies? No, there's a massive change. We see it everywhere. In fact, the Federal Reserve Board, after the 08 09 crisis, thought they were going to be able to protect the whole system from all these changes. In fact, it's gotten worse because the interlocking the world is something nobody can control, and that factor keeps growing and growing. What does that imply for regulation post-crisis? The most important thing to keep in mind that the world is not linear, it's non-linear. So, uh, you know, I, I talk to different people who are Federal Reserve Board governors, and over and over again, the lesson we've learned 
not once, not twice, three times, four times. Is this is a nonlinear world? Therefore, don't try to have any absolutes. Try to adjust constantly to the changing situation. It's almost a Bayesian mathematic concept across the board. And that's the basic regulatory lesson is in a massively changing world, you can't have these absolutes. They don't work. Take me through the crisis from your perspective and roll forward to today. So let let me just say I'm a financial analyst because I failed at being an oil and gas analyst because I was an oil and gas analyst, but then oil collapsed. So then I became a analysts of casinos. The problem with that was that there weren't that many casinos. So very quickly, I couldn't break into the casino mold. So I simply was looking for something that had a thousand different variables. Or in financials, there were 5,000, 10,000 banks in the United States because the Puritans brought their culture to the United States that every single community, every single community should have both a bank and insurance company. That lesson from 1620 has spread to Hawaii. So I could do financials because if somebody else followed 10, then I would follow another 10. So I could compete with Merrill Lynch. So that's how I ended up as being a financial analyst. In terms of the crisis, it's something that I followed on an almost hourly basis and have very, very strong views. I laugh at people's different explanations. Really, some of the key factors was, first of all, in a nonlinear world, you're going to have these events, period. And people want absolute answers. There are no absolute answers sometimes. Having said that, the financial crisis was a rolling crisis. And even when you know it's coming, you don't want to believe it's coming. I, I knew it was coming. That doesn't mean I didn't lose lots of money on the financial crisis because even when you know something, you sometimes have trouble acting. It's like if you know the end of the world is coming, you you don't necessarily act on it. You don't want to believe it. And that's just a basic lesson of human life. And so I knew it was coming. I was involved with New Century when it went bankrupt in February of 08. I was in the CDO market when it was completely shut down by June. I, and Bear Stearns going under, Fannie and Freddie going under. It was, I knew it was coming, but that doesn't mean you can stop it uh, or even act on it. The financial crisis, as I said, was just simply uh, was a nonlinear event, and it was exaggerated by a series of actions by a number of companies. If you wanted to know what is the number one, one of the probably one of the bigger factors was AIG basically creating a box that basically insured mortgages. It's and what they did really was they said, look, we'll insure this box of mortgages for a billion dollars. No, ten billion dollars. 100 billion. It's the same thing. What if everyone in the audience was allowed to insure their house for $10 trillion? Well, I can guarantee you the country would go under because one of those houses is going to burn down. And when that house burns down, somebody theoretically has to pay $10 trillion. And therefore, it's impossible for the companies to pay it, whoever it is. And it has a whole series of knockoff effects when that house burns down. So that was one big factor, but I would say there were many, many factors leading to it. The biggest factor was the loss of confidence. The biggest factor was the failure of the government to take that last bit of action because they got nervous when Lehman failed. They took the action when Bear Stearns failed. They took action when Fannie and Freddie failed. Fannie and Freddie were 10 times bigger than Lehman, yet it didn't have any knockoff impact. It was two-thirds of the GDP of the entire United States, Fannie and Freddie at the time. It, they failed, but it didn't create the crisis. The crisis was created when Lehman failed and the government did nothing. They just simply decided, well, we don't have the authority to act, which we know is not true because you can read laws a million different ways. Once that happened, people lost confidence because 
what happened there was you had two sets of massive derivatives and the people who were going to lose on it said, look, you know, they failed. We're not taking our loss. You saw what the problem was. But as you said, that's different from acting. How did you then figure out when to turn and buy? That's a very important lesson in life because you have to pick yourself up and figure out, okay, what's going to happen next and how do you go forward? That decision was a lot easier because once the government began to intervene and the brilliance of the government, this was at the time a $16 trillion economy, they said, look, we're putting up $5 trillion of potential guarantees. We're putting up $10 trillion. No, we're putting up $20 trillion. No, we're putting up $50 trillion. Well, it's like anything else in life. If there is a safety net that's there, you're then not worried. And all of a sudden, the government never had to put up $50 trillion or $40 trillion or $20 trillion. But once they said we're going to put up safety net, not for everybody, but for the larger players, and they explained to me, look, Manny, this is a hurricane, and we have passenger ships sinking, we have freighters sinking, we have little ships sinking, we have little frigates sinking. We've got to focus on the passenger ships and the bigger ships because there's nothing else we can do. And that is the way life is sometimes. And that's what they did. And it, they did a brilliant, remarkable job. I can't believe that people still complain about TARP and what the government did. It's really because they literally lack an understanding of how the system works, how interconnected all the system is. And what was the impetus for you starting your second business, EJF? You know, my second business, the part that I love most about being in the business was really the research end, the idea of matching your wits against the world or or everyone else in terms of researching ideas, looking at new ideas that come up every second, being at the cutting edge. And that's the excitement of doing what I do. Just because I just do financials, that doesn't mean the you know, biggest thing I'm looking at is CRISPR, which is literally changing the world. It scares the hell out of me because of of what its potential is. That's the basic gene editing technique that came out of Stanford, MIT, and Harvard. But it, it's just mind-boggling what the implications are. And so I look at everything. That doesn't mean it always links up to what I invest in because we have a broad mandate in financials which is a big area. But that doesn't mean the same way that I was an oil and gas analyst 50 years ago, 40 years ago, I still look at oil and gas every hour, every day. And the same thing in the medical area. You're dealing in ideas. You're dealing in new thoughts. And that's really what we do. What's the most exciting idea that you've seen in the markets? Well, the most interesting thing that people should look at today, and it's very, very, very early, is in the tax code. There is a provision that creates what we call opportunity zones, and the governors everywhere in the United States have declared different places opportunity zones, and I think that's quite an interesting area. What do you do with that? Is that an economic opportunity zone? It's uh, creating a tax advantage way to invest in, in these areas, which I believe over time will have a big impact. And certainly one of the biggest impact over time is on the economy, because I believe it'll be one, two, three trillion dollars. Remember, this is a eighteen trillion dollar economy, and because of the way they did it, it has to be done quickly. Sometimes, what has an impact is because you have to put the money to work and build factories and build new apartments rather quickly. That has the biggest impact. I mean, people say, "Well, the tax bill." I haven't seen the impact. Yes, it's true because. It takes months. It takes a year. Repatriation was $3 trillion. You haven't seen the first factory built. It takes a year for 
Apple to build their glass factory, or it takes three years or five years. You got to plan it, you got to find the site, you got to engineer it, so forth and so on, or whether it's pharmaceutical companies. This is an example where things are going to happen unbelievably quickly. It's going to create enormous loan demand for small banks, regional banks all over the country. And I believe, we'll see, I've been wrong a lot of times before, but I believe this will be one of the major, major events in the country, similar to how big the 08, 09 crisis was. In your investment universe, do you play that by looking at, say, regional community banks in those opportunity zones? Well, I think that is certainly one way to invest in it. It's very, very early. Please keep that in mind. We don't even have the regulations from the internal revenue at this stage. All we have is a box, a framework from the tax bill. And this was something different people worked on for six years. Actually, the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, along with Republicans, Cory Booker, Senator Warner, this is a great example of what the country sometimes can accomplish when it does come together instead of just ripping the shreds out of each other every single day. And it will have an impact. It'll have an impact over time in terms of creating hundreds of thousands of jobs and opportunities. When you think about taking advantage of an opportunity like that in the markets, what you're talking about is potentially a long horizon theme. How do you balance that against the needs, desires, of your clients and funds who are looking at generally shorter time horizons? Well, this fortunately has added advantage of forcing people to look at it long term because this allows everybody in the United States, whether they are have a $1,000 gain, a $50,000 capital gain, have a $4 billion capital gain, It means everybody can take advantage of this because using this investment opportunity, if you keep it over five years, seven years, and 10 years, so it forces you to think long-term, which is quite brilliant because we all have a tendency to think too short-term. If you do that, then you can defer your gains. It's mind-boggling. Just think there's a trillion dollars of gains a year in capital gains in this country. There's probably three, four, five, six trillion dollars that are capital gains that people haven't taken. No one really knows what the number is. It allows people to take those gains, invest in these areas, create jobs, and create housing and, you know, take a 10-year horizon because otherwise you're not going to get to defer your gains, period. That's a huge advantage, a huge appeal to millions and millions of people. So let's take the other side. What do you see as the biggest risks in the financial system today? The biggest risk in the financial system, again, is that unknown, a nonlinear system. So you have these unknowns that theoretically could happen, you know, a coup in you know, major countries or riots in different countries. What if North Korea gets angry at Trump or it doesn't go well and they send an atom bomb to Wake Island? Okay, to me, the biggest risk to the financial system is that gigantic macro unknown And therefore, it's an unknown, and we don't even know what it is. And so that is always what fools everybody, and it's that that massive nonlinear effect that takes place. I want to turn back to your investment philosophy. How do you think about approaching the challenge of being entrusted with this money? You know, whether you like it or not, the goal is to have real performance and try to get that performance without taking inordinate risk, which is often a contradiction. What makes people smart in the market or geniuses in the market, there are no geniuses in the market, period, is to find those tailwinds. If you can find those tailwinds, that's what makes you brilliant. And you want those tailwinds to last 
one year, two years, three years, four years, if possible, or 10 years. But if you can catch those tailwinds, that's what makes you like you're smart, period. And I believe also that I'm anxious for the indexes and the machines to become a bigger and bigger part of the market. I'll give you a great example. Well, all I have to do is try to make sure I get a non-REIT into the index. I know 60% of it's going to be bought, especially if it's a small company. Well, I'm waiting for the day when, when the index is 90%. Of the market. I'm waiting for the day when the key is to have staying power to last is when, you know, the machines or the indexes are 95% of the market. Then you'll make money hand over fist. It's like, it's impossible. If, if the machines know where the market's going in the next two days, it can't go there. If we all know what's going to happen tomorrow, it's not going to happen. It's impossible because everybody acts differently. So by definition, if you know something, it almost can't happen. So a lot of people view machines as a headwind, particularly to traditional fundamental investing. You're talking about it as a potential opportunity. Well, I'm set. looking at it from a much, much narrower point of view. I'm looking at it as a money manager who's trying to outperform the machines of the market. I, when they're 20% of the market, it, you know, they're much more effective or the indexes than when they're 50. But by definition, the bigger they get, the more impossible it is. And what are the other big tailwinds that you're excited about? Well, I'm, I'm excited about the tailwinds of, the, of what's happening in the small bank area, which is a massive consolidation. I'm excited about the tailwinds that I believe are taking place in the economy in terms of I view our economy is going to be very, very strong. Other people don't believe that. They think we're at the end of a cycle. But please keep in mind what just has happened in the last six months. We have an $18 trillion economy. We just have a $2 trillion tax cut. We just had a $3 trillion, which is taking place as we speak, of repatriation. That is money that the major tech companies and mainly pharmaceutical companies, it was very, very concentrated, put away overseas and didn't pay tax on. They were able to bring it back to the United States and pay a 10% tax. So that repatriated money is gigantic because some of those companies are going to build factories. They don't build factories overnight. They're going to be super sophisticated factories. There is another $2 trillion that they just decided when they wanted to have a budget agreement, and this is maybe a little bit of lack of discipline. Is it, what do the Democrats want? Democrats wanted eight $900 billion of new spending. What do the Republicans want? They wanted eight $900 billion of additional tax cuts. Well, add those together, that's another... Two trillion. I'm just talking about the opportunity zone also was hidden in a little bit in the tax code, and we don't know how big that is. So if you add eight, nine trillion dollars onto an eighteen trillion dollar economy, it has an impact. And you haven't seen it even begin. And so I would say that one view that is completely different from other people is I believe there will be real wage inflation in this country. There already is a skilled labor shortage every major city in the United States. This is the first time ever people can come out of prison with no government program. If you have a skill, you can get a job. If you're a welder, you have a job in 10 seconds. We had a million government programs to help people come out of prison. It didn't mean one iota. It didn't make one difference. Once you create such a demand for skilled labor in this country, which we have a shortage, a massive shortage now, it will create wage inflation. Once you see the effect of these things, it's even going to create in cities, in big cities, a what we call an unskilled labor shortage. In New York, you have trouble keeping dishwashers. I have a program in Washington to clean up parks. I have to pay people $25 an hour to do that. These are not skilled laborers. This is people who normally wouldn't even have a job, they're getting paid $25 an hour because that's the going rate versus going and working at a landscaping 
opportunity for the day. So I don't think people realize how strong the economy is going to be, especially given all the noise in the media that never stops. But the basic facts are so powerful. Now, the confusion is there's a massive split in this country and every single country in the world between urban and rural. And that has nothing to do with the United States. If you really look at the split in this country, it's not between Clinton and Trump. It's not between Republicans and Democrats. So much of it is really between urban and rural where the rural parts are left behind, and that portion is increasing. It's not just United States. It's true in China. Go to China. Go to the interior of China. You feel like you've gone back 500 years. Leave Moscow and go out other parts of Russia. It's like going back 500 years. It's in everywhere. It's in the UAE. It's in Sri Lanka. It doesn't make any difference where you go in the world. There's a power law taking place that Basically, it drives people to the cities, and it's increasing every day, especially with the Internet, especially with intellectual capital being so powerful, especially with young people across the board. Let's talk about the impact of technology on what you're doing. Well, technology is having an impact. I wouldn't say it's having a, a massive impact, but it's something you have to be aware of over time, certainly Banks are going to be un- under unbelievable pressure, but I'm talking 20 years from now by this. I'm holding up a cell phone, an Apple phone, because go to Kenya. there You don't have banks. You have mobile payments. Go to China. So wherever you have a lack of infrastructure and anything, a new technology can come in, overpower everything. It's when you have a very powerful old infrastructure it takes technology a longer period of time to overwhelm the old infrastructure but we're certainly seeing everywhere technology impacting things i would say the biggest risk in investing is because of technology it's what i call stranded asset so today what is a stranded asset a stranded asset is an asset used to be unbelievably valuable is now worthless it's stranded like a, a whale on a beach a coal mine is a stranded asset in the united states it's only has any value because it already went through bankruptcy and wiped out all the liabilities it had so coal is going to be a stranded asset You know, malls in different parts of the United States are stranded assets. Literally, when technology hits, it changes. Newspapers, most newspapers have become stranded assets. And that is the biggest decision to make when you're investing often is try to foresee what is going to become a stranded asset. So the movie industry today is changing because Netflix, Amazon are changing the entire model. So all of a sudden... It happens very, very quickly where where your whole model is broken and the same thing Amazon is doing, though it takes 20 years at times to retail. So I would argue lots of assets that you think are very, very valuable, such as oil, will eventually be stranded. It might take 10 years, might take 15, 20 years, but it, when it, it's stranded, it doesn't mean it's worthless. It means it's worth a lot less than it is today. But the stranded asset issue is one of the key issues of investing, at least long term, because what you think is good today is really going to disappear on you. So I believe those are strong tailwinds. I'm nervous about interest rates going up. I'm less interested in REITs. I think people lose perspective. When you talk about interest rates, go back to George Washington days. Go back to Revolutionary War. You'll see rates are 2%. Then they go to 10%. And then they go back to 3%. And there's a series of events from from the crisis of 1840 to the Civil War to World War One to the Spanish-American War. It goes on and on. And People forget how broad some of the rate moves are. Historically, we've never had in history, it's impossible, that it's like we have in Europe, negative interest rates. There's no such thing in history. It's artificial. And so interest rates are just a, a very interesting tailwind that I feel 
we will see higher rates. And therefore, you try to adjust your portfolio to that. You know, what we do, and which we try to do better than anybody, is we try to anticipate regulatory change. We're in a regulatory business, period. And look, it's not just banking. It's not just insurance. It's all industries are more and more affected by governments, period. And so we always want to be super aware of regulatory changes. That was part of our success in the 08 09 crisis, to call that correctly. And we're seeing, you know, really big regulatory changes in the last year, two year, year and a half in the banking industry, both from the Federal Reserve Board, from the new administration, and also from Congress. We just had, for the first time in 10 years, a regulatory relief bill that changes the rules for small banks changes the rules for regional banks, makes it very, very favorable for them. And just as important, which people forget about, I can't believe so many people voted against the bill, just just an automatic reflex. It had a piece that changed the rule for immigrants, for people who had you know, missed a payment, who can't get a mortgage before, now they can get a mortgage from a bank. That's, I don't know how many mortgages, that could be a million mortgages, it could be two million mortgages. That was a result of the pendulum swinging to the extreme under Dodd-Frank, where we outlawed liar loans. But whenever you take a regulatory action, there is other effects. There's effects you don't predict. You There are the unknown effects that take place, and that was one of them. It meant immigrants in, you, in the country couldn't get a mortgage. They have to go to a hedge fund to get a mortgage. Well, that's just got change, which is phenomenal. What do you think happens with Dodd-Frank as it relates to trading markets? Well, I think we're going to get some loosening. I think you're not going to get massive changes for the big banks because the Federal Reserve Board's view is, look, we care about the 10 big banks in this country. They're significant. J.P. Morgan is systemically important. Citicorp is systemically important. So there isn't going to be massive relief for the big banks because there isn't the political will on the Democratic side or the Republican side or by the Federal Reserve Board. There'll be some tweaks here and there. I don't think you'll see any kind of really massive change. What's your view on liquidity of the markets today? Liquidity has declined because of, of, of really changes in the market, of what machines do. And there's no doubt that liquidity has gotten a lot less than it used to be. But it's not disastrous. It's part of the change that takes place anyway. When you have such broad and strong views about the economy, about the markets. How do you work with your team? So we have 75 people on our team. And so I believe very, very strongly in trying to avoid groupthink. We've seen it over and over again, where where a dominating idea can be a disaster, because as strong as my ideas are sometimes, remember, they're often wrong period, or they lead you down the wrong path. And so the key to working any investment, any idea, is to be able to change your mind every single second, to get new information and say, look, what I thought was right was wrong. I mean, anybody who followed the last election, if they were flexible, would have known how close it is. Everyone, it's the fact you dig yourself into the ground, that's what creates the being wrong. So when I work with our team, we try to have as much as a open forum as, as possible. You try to get ideas from everybody. I don't care whether they're a new person, old person, been in the market one year, 10 years, 50 years. And you try to keep an open system because the main thing in investments is how quickly things change, how often you're wrong. And that's what's often great about it is you actually can see that you're wrong in the market all the time. So being wrong, what's been your biggest mistake? In the market, you're going to make mistakes and you're going to be dead wrong at times. And often, certainly in the early days, there's a tendency 
always to think things are linear, so something's going up, therefore it's going to go up for a long period of time, and that's not the case. There's a a constant equilibrium. There's a constant regression to the mean, really. Uh, And so that is always happening in the market. You know, I've been wrong a hundred times, a thousand times. That doesn't mean the whole goal is not to be wrong or right. The idea is to be right a little bit more than you're wrong or when you are right to really, if you are right and you see the reinforcements, is to push resources into that breakthrough. And that really makes up for all the times you're going to be wrong. And how does that work its way into a portfolio? So you have your team, someone's bringing up the idea, you're clearly the decision maker. How, so do, you, how do you size so things? In a lot of areas, I'm not the decision maker. You have to remember, we are doing a lot of different things. So in many, many areas, I'm not making the decision at all. We're maybe making a decision that, look, there's 5,000 small banks in the United States that small banks from a general viewpoint are going to go through a consolidation. Most of them are private. We're going to invest in private small banks. So we've made that decision. I'm not executing that investment. The same thing where a very large player in the debt of small banks through CDOs, we've made that decision. I'm not executing that because it's very technical. And so other people are really executing. I'm executing some ideas, but also brainstorming with people, just trying to hear what their thoughts are and use their thoughts. Let's turn a little bit and talk about philanthropy. Sure. Another, another subject you're passionate about. How did you first get interested in giving back and when in your life did you do it? My father was a rabbi in a small town in the South where I grew up. And my mother was an immigrant. Uh, she was a socialist in a small town in the South, Wilmington, North Carolina. And they both had unbelievably strong views about philanthropy or money in terms of its value. And that was really almost indoctrinated into you from the time you're three, four, five years old. I mean, day and night, whether it's putting a dime into a charity box or that means when someone is coming by to ask for money, you bring them into the house and you talk to them and feed them. And so really that was ingrained to me from a very early point. Probably the most important point, though, was from my mother, who had very, very tough views about social views and the value of money. And she viewed money as having no meaning, no value, unless you did something with it. And the idea of people having three houses and sitting by the pool from the time I was very young, she would mock those people. I mean, make fun of them to an extreme. And so you're taught that. And you don't easily lose those those lessons from the time you were three, four, five, six, and seven. So that's really, you know, the biggest strength of those values that are really American values. They're powerful American values that we're part of a community. You first take care of your family, then you take care of your community, and then you take care of the country and then the world. But, but you've got to start somewhere. But it's those values of money. Money has no meaning. Even today, it has no meaning to me except for what I can do with it to change things. And what's the most important thing you're doing to change things today? It's hard. It's impossible to, uh, to make much of a difference. And it's, you know, when you really think about it, it gets very discouraging. But we're doing things a lot of different ways. I had terrible asthma as a kid. I still, as a child, uh, I still have asthma. So I have a big asthma project with Children's Hospital in Anacostia in D.C. to get five, six, seven-year-olds to take their medicine every day because asthma is something you can control. Uh, education, there's nothing more important than education. So we have lots of education programs. So we have a lot of conservation programs because what's going on in, in the world is is what we're doing to the animals, the plants, It's just mind-boggling. We're like one great big vacuum cleaner just taking everything out. Eventually, it has an impact. 
So, you know, the movie we're doing Eating Animals, which is something we're doing on the philanthropy side to try to make people realize what's going on in factory farms all over the world is really quite frightening, devastating. There's a massive cost to it. It's insane. Um, We have a very big program for Jewish outreach to make the tent as big as we can in terms of making sure we try to reach out to everybody. So we have really three or four different goals and probably have a hundred programs now. All right, Manny, let's turn to some closing questions. Sure. What was your favorite extracurricular achievement? So my favorite extracurricular achievement was probably promoting this movie, Eating Animals, because I'm going around the country or from place to place where uh, really my niece who runs our philanthropy is doing it, and, I, and I'm seeing the change take place as we speak. You go to college campuses and ask people how many people are eating less meat or are becoming vegetarians. It's mind-boggling the change that's taking place in this country. And so this is a, one of the first times ever where I feel like we're moving the needle not an inch, but maybe moving it a foot at a time. So that's pretty exciting for me, at least, in terms of things that I do outside of work. And how about in your youth? In my youth, the most interesting extracurricular activity was probably going to Israel to seeing the roots of my parents. They both were born in Palestine under the British and go back and sort of see where they came from and both came from Jerusalem. No different than people going back to Ireland to see their roots or Germany or Nigeria or Sri Lanka to see all the ancestors or the where you came from is very very powerful. What's your biggest investment pet peeve? My biggest investment pet peeve is the short-term demands of managing money where I have to look at my phone as soon as this interview is finished and see where everything closed because I know the pressure really as a manager you're under on every two weeks on a monthly basis on a two-month basis so uh, that's really probably the short-term nature of investing can be very destructive is it solvable it's human behavior so it is possibly solvable if you maybe made some major changes but I don't know what the answer is, but hopefully somebody else besides me can come up with an answer. But that is really uh, one of my pet peeves. What teaching from your parents most stayed with you other than don't walk on ledges? I had a very strong mother who had very powerful values about living life a certain way, being able to not resort to have all the peer pressure affect you you could in a sense dance to your own drummer that's what she did in palestine she fought with a british soldier when she was 15 years old who was knocking down stands in the market where widows used to have to go and it's something she basically forced into me over and over again about what is right and what it's wrong and how to do that or try to do it every single day. The most we can do is be 5248. It's so hard. But those were very strong values about our obligations to society and what is the real use of money, period. What do you read daily? So I'm an obsessive reader because I had asthma as a kid. So, you know, I read obviously all of the newspapers, but I read or skim seven, eight, nine books a week. And I read in different areas and all the way from behavioral economics to fiction to to different areas about animals. So I have a very wide interest and it's reading is something that's very 
almost obsessive with me. And one of the most powerful books I just read that everybody should read is a book about trees. It's called The Overstory. It's a sh- group of short stories that's about trees. And one of the most powerful pieces in it is about how the acacia trees can sit there and kill 3,000 kudos, which is a huge, a huge antelope that they put into wildlife corrals in, in southern Africa. And, but it really is a massive lesson about life and about communities and the interplay between everything in a community. But it's a very, very powerful book. All right, last one. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in your life? The biggest thing is that you're going to be defeated over and over and over again. And when you go through those defeats, it you sort of think it's the end of the world or you're not going to be able to go forward. And I wish I knew better that life's a pretty long journey, hopefully, and that these defeats are just are going to happen and not to let them slow you down. And I wish I knew that a lot earlier. Manny, thank you so okay. much. Hey, before you take off, I've started sending out a monthly email that shares a small selection of what caught my eye over the month. I get a lot of emails like this, and I'm sure you do too. So I'm only going to send no more than a handful of the very best things that caught my eye. If you'd like to receive that email, hop on my website at capitalallocatorspodcast.com and join the mailing list.